Hi, I'm Shitzel Rue. Welcome to the Inside Network. Welcome to the Inside Network. Today I'm joined by Yasmina Osmanovic from Potentum Partners, a new private equity uh, group and with the founding members having come out of the Future Fund. Uh, Yasmina's expertise lies in co-investment. So Yasmina, could you give us your processes in co-investment, its merits, its pitfalls? Uh, give us a bit of a description of the asset segment. At Potentum Partners, we try to align ourselves with the leading global private equity managers and follow them into their highest conviction investments. Co-investment in general is, is highly desired by investors because it comes on, in most parts on a fee and carry free basis. So it's a really attractive way of accessing what can be a quite an expensive asset class. It also helps with a lot of the unfunded capital issues that can happen with private equity because the deal gets invested straight away. Um, as, a, as a limited partner, being involved in a co-investment also enables you to do better diligence on a manager because you're actually involved in the deal, get to see how they think about things and, and how they work real time. It also does enable you to potentially get access to, uh, greater access to a, to a manager that, uh, that is capacity constrained on the primary fund side. The biggest pitfall with, uh, with co-investment is, is alignment and, and alignment is, is more complex in, in a co-investment scenario than it is in a fund investment. Um, generally when an investor receives an opportunity, the biggest issue that they need to consider is, uh, is adverse selection and, and an investor really has to ask why am I being shown this an opportunity, is, is the manager showing me this because uh, they've, they've invested in the company and realised that actually there are some issues here and so now they're trying to syndicate away some of that risk or is this an investment where the manager is already a, a shareholder and, uh, and it's an underperforming company so they're trying to bring in a new investor to, to give the company a bit more runway. And so it's really important that uh, you, you have strong relationships with these, um, with these managers that are showing you these deals and, and your primary, uh, you're an investor in their primary funds as well, such that they're less inclined to, to show you an unfavourable deal because they don't want to do anything that could damage that relationship. Mm, fascinating. Uh, do certain companies or sectors or structures lend themselves more to co investment than others? So, you know, how, how broad is the opportunity set? Well, generally co-investments are made available to, to investors when the, the equity required for the company is greater than what the fund has capacity to do, which you know, ordinarily lends itself to, to larger businesses on the buyout side or very capital intensive businesses in venture. Realistically, uh, co-investments are available in, in all sectors. Uh, Generally, a fund uh, has a 10% concentration limit, where a individual company can't be more than 10% of a fund. So, you know, a deal that a, a small or mid-market manager would have to co-invest, it can actually be done by a larger manager. So, we find that that opportunities are available across all sectors. Hmm. Can you take us through the investment process, the sort of structural elements to it, uh, a timeline, you know, decision making? Uh, how you get your money out, how does it make a flow? So on the buyout side, there's, there's generally two, two avenues uh, that, uh, that a manager takes. It, it can either be co-underwriting where a, a investor is bought in very early during the diligence process and, and they work alongside the, the manager to develop an underwriting case and in the event that the deal doesn't happen, they will also share in the broken, fee, uh, broken deal cost. The, the other way is post deal syndication where a manager will close on a deal and then subsequent to that send, um, go out to its investors and offer them an opportunity to, to take a portion of their, of their investment. Um, generally with those there's a pre-prepared pre data room with all the information that they are gathered during their own diligence process and that gets sent to investors and they might have a three to four week period where they can make a decision on whether they are willing to accept, uh, accept the deal as it is or not. Uh, in both those situations, 
the, the manager is generally the, the person who has control of both the company and the, and the investments. So the co-investors are generally tied up to the exit mechanisms that the, that the manager takes. Okay. On the post-syndication side, um, a manager will often set up a vehicle specifically for co-investors. And so the investors are even more bound by the, the terms of that vehicle and have more limited scope to actually sell down their position before a manager decides to do so. How, how many were typically involved in a co-investment deal? In other words, not the manager, how many, just give me yes. a... I guess it depends on the size of the deal um, and the size of the, the LPs that are involved. So large sovereign funds or institutions can write you know, multi-hundred million dollar checks and some managers prefer to just work with one large party, especially on the co-underwriting side where we've seen um, they go to a large sovereign wealth fund and they are the only co-investors in the process and they get involved very early and it becomes effectively a, a consortium between the two of them. On the syndication side, they generally try to bring in a lot of investors because um, you know, given that they're on a fee and carry free basis, a lot of investors want access to these sort of opportunities, so they don't want to be seen to be cherry picking one LP versus another. So on the syndication side, we find that it goes quite broad and some of the checks can be quite small where individual investors are investing five million and some others are putting in a hundred. Can you give us some colour about the level of cooperation and competition, both between the co-investments and the co-investment syndicators and the, the manager? You know, how do you actually deal with that? So alignment um, is key in this, uh, and um, and the, this really plays out when a situation is distressed. Um, a really good example is when um, when a company has no residual value left. Uh, it's much easier for the manager to walk away and just focus their attention on some other investments that they've got in their portfolio. So what's really important is ensuring that the manager you're backing to do this investment has a reputational interest in ensuring that this deal is a success because they've built a reputation on being able to be best in class in this particular strategy or this particular sector. And you also really need to ensure that the general partner that is working on this deal has its, uh, their personal track record as well as their carried interests at stake such that they're really incentivised to try and regain as much value as they can in this investment. Uh, the, the competition also shows up in, uh, in having to do follow-on investments. So what we find is in, in a distressed opportunity where investors need to pour in more, more money into a business, there can be quite um, some tension between the manager who has much better access to information, has been on the board, has been having active control of the business versus, versus the co-investors who are passive investors and get, might get quarterly reports. And, and you need to be really careful that the manager has the best interests of both the co-investors and the fund in mind and they're not going to make a decision that will disadvantage the co-investors. The, the other situation where we find that competition is, and, um, and issues can arise quite a common is in venture co-investment. In venture co-investment, the manager is most likely already an investor in the company and so it's really important uh, to get comfortable that this is an opportunity that they have high conviction in and they're not just, being, uh, you're not, they're not just going out to their co-investors to try and get some more capital to give the business a more runway. So what's really important in those opportunities is, is seeing a manager really leaning in and putting more than its pro rata in the next financing round to, to really highlight their conviction in the opportunity. What, um, again, is there a typical number about the proportion of the business that's held within the manager versus the co-investor group or? Not necessarily. Um, so you know, the most concentrations limits will prevent uh, more than 10% of the fund being in any individual company. So, so that dictates um, the size of the equity check that the fund can do. But realistically, there's no limit. It's just the manager will want to control, to maintain control of the investment and generally, even in a syndicated deal where there's a special vehicle set up, there are provisions in those vehicles that would enable a, a manager to be removed for cause and sometimes for um, not for cause. So they probably not want to sell down more than 50% of their equity to continue to maintain that control. Can you just take us through some of the way the valuations work in the industry? Are they always leaning on equity-like valuations or are there other valuation techniques that you are using? 
I think it depends on the sector. So um, in venture capital, it's an evaluation is, is a lot more difficult and so it relies a lot on revenue multiples which are forward looking and a lot of the time very hard to verify um, the viability of those forecasts. And, and in venture we find that uh, you know, there's a lot of scope to, um, for valuations to be very, very driven by investor sentiment. So there are a lot of sectors or companies that can become hot where there, there's a lot of demand for investors to get into those businesses because it's seen as a mark of quality by being an investor in something that's very hot at the moment. And so in those sort of sectors we just find that valuations can just become extreme and completely not justified on a fundamental basis. On the buyout side, it is generally a more um, traditional DCF. You're looking at the future value of cash flows and, and factoring in what comparables are doing generally on an EBITDA, EBITDA basis. Uh, but, but what we're finding is in this current environment, investors are really seeking out growth. And in any business or any sector that's growing at a rate that's larger than uh, the market average is, is trading at a significant uh, premium. Um, ESG has found its way into private equity as well. What observations can you give it to us about the way that's discussed in, in private equity circles? Governance has always been a big issue from a private equity perspective, but we're really starting to see managers put more focus on the other factors as well, and in particular social issues. I find that ESG is an area where investors can actually differentiate themselves and add a lot of value to, to private equity managers. A lot of the time, um, limited partners will have a more developed framework from an ESG perspective, and this is a space where they can really add value to a co-investment by, by potentially taking a different perspective than the manager would and being able to, to provide some ESG-related due diligence for the manager that they might not have seen themselves. Hmm, interesting. And, and that kind of leads on to different management styles. Do you see uh, you know, we're used to Europe being a small business, family type style businesses that dominated. In private equity, do you find different style biases between different regions, be it Europe, US, Asia or wherever? Well, not necessarily. Um, even in the US, we find that a lot of the really good quality businesses that private equity are going after are quite often family owned, especially in the mid-market space. What we do find is, is the challenges that uh, these managers have to deal with are quite different across geographies. In Europe, a lot of these businesses are regional, so they're having to deal with both cultural differences and language differences, which makes management much more difficult than in the US where it's, there's different states, but uh, it's still quite very similar. Thank you, Yasmina. Thank you, Giselle. Thank you.